right. <laughs> So who are you? <laughs> uh, my name is Peter Biddle, and I run the BitLocker team. Okay. And what is that? <laughs> so BitLocker is a feature in Windows Vista, and uh, we encrypt the entire Windows volume. Um, we use a TPM. Uh, actually, there's a couple of implementations or ways you can use the feature. The primary way is to use a TPM as... What's a TPM? Uh, TPM is a trusted platform module. Okay. So you can, um, uh, if you... Go on your favorite search engine and type TPM. Um, you'll find lots of hits on it. But if you think of it as being a lot like uh, one of these uh, smart card chip, except it's soldered to the motherboard. Yep. So while a smart card represents who you are and something you know, a TPM represents what a machine is. Um, so in that sense, it provides a machine identity. And um, it has a, a TPM has an interesting property. It, it lets you store keys okay. on the TPM itself. And that's interesting because um, if you're going to do encryption, you need a place to store your keys. Yeah. Historically, there's been two major ways of doing that on PCs. So the first way has been you take the key and you stick it somewhere else, like on a floppy or mm -hmm. a piece of paper. Or a USB um, key. Or, or a USB key or uh, on a smart card, right? Um, or uh, you uh, obfuscate the key by sticking it in some unencrypted file or area on the hard drive. And um, both of those uh, solutions have their, their sort of pluses and minuses. The biggest minus about storing a, a key on a piece of media or a piece of paper or anything else is that you tend to lose them. Yeah. And encryption tends to be one of those things where the more secure it is, the harder it is to replace that key. The harder it is to replace that key, the riskier it is that you may lose your data forever. Right. Why, why do bit, why, why do BitLocker? What, um, what's the customer? Right. Thing? So there's, we started out um, uh, with one scenario, and that was lost or stolen laptops. So to get back to the, the, this problem of where do you store the key, uh, um, we, we've typically, in Windows, we've used uh, an un unencrypted file, the registry, as a place to store our keys. And that's had a couple of problems. The biggest, one of the problems has been that um, you can potentially find out what the key is just by attacking the hard drive using, you know, tools of your own. The other problem is, is that you can go in, uh, potentially go into Windows, the portions that are unencrypted, and do things like create your own administrator account. And if you can create your own administrator account, then you can just unlock the machine and you sort of bypass the entire thing. So the lost and stolen laptop scenario is you've used um, uh, EFS or not, but whatever, I've stolen your laptop and I want to get at the data. Um, and some of that data is very high value, right? We're yep. seeing lots of news reports about the value of this. When we first started working on this, it was kind of funny. From carrying around medical records or credit card data? Uh, yeah, 100,000 customer records with credit card. For, you know, if it's, a, if it's like an insurance company, there's a good chance that it has your home address, your social security number, your banking information, um, uh, potentially multiple loan addresses, your mortgage information. I mean, that's very valuable information. And if uh, getting at that data is easy with software tools, then any sort of idiot who's stolen your laptop can do it. It's yep. a low, low barrier to entry attack. Yeah. You can download the software, you run it on the machine, find me spreadsheets, you know, look for, look for strings that look like credit card numbers. I can automate that task. I don't have to be smart at all to do it. Um, I can boot another operating system. I don't even need to use the operating system that's on the drive. I just boot yep. another operating system off of a CD or a USB dongle, and away I go. Not to advertise how to uh, attack drives, but uh, this stuff is pretty easy yeah, to find. I, mean, I know how to do yeah. this, and if I know how to do it, <laughs> it's out. <laughs> Anybody knows that. So when we first started looking, my 12-year-old son is smarter right. than I am about computers. <laughs> um, when we first started looking at this, lost and stolen laptops seemed like a really cool, like a really cool thing to look at because um, uh, we knew that. We, uh, TPMs um, would let us store the key in a place that's both local and remote, right? So it's local in that it travels around with the machine, but it's remote, it's not on the hard drive itself. And because the TPM protects itself from attack, it means that it keeps its key secret. By keeping its key secret, it makes it much harder for an adversary who has stolen your laptop to get at the data. Yeah. They still can, right? It's not foolproof. If they've got physical access to the machine and they're smart enough, they can do things like Peel the chip. Well, peeling the chip is something that your average criminal can't automate with software tools. It's hard. Yeah. It's often to, I stole this laptop because for some reason I know you're carrying around nuclear launch codes and I want the nuclear launch codes. Yeah. At which point you kind of hope that someone carrying around us uses more than just BitLocker to protect their stuff. Yeah. Guns and stuff. Um, <laughs> 
So, uh, so we started out with lost and stolen laptops, but um, and we've gotten a lot of customer feedback. Yeah, we love this. We love this. This is fantastic. It's great. We love the use of the TPM. We like the fact that um, that because we use a TPM, the user doesn't have to enter in additional credentials. Right. It just runs. Right. And if you enter in your Windows credentials, by you know, we, you just run, you log in the way you normally would to Windows. BitLocker is just there underneath encrypting and decrypting sectors. It's way down low. It's underneath the file system. It's underneath applications. It's at the very bottom of the stack, essentially right above you know the block level device drivers. Yeah. Um, so you get uh, you get this sort of airbag phenomenon where. Uh, you don't even know it's on until it needs to go off. It goes off because somebody stole your laptop and they want to get your data. Yeah. Um, we found out since then that servers are really interesting. So why? Well, we thought servers would be protected by big iron doors and people with guns and stuff like that. It turns out a lot of them aren't. Yeah. Um, over 25% of the installed base of servers are called branch office servers. Yeah. They tend to be behind things like cardboard or you know drywall. Yeah. Um, they are not necessarily in a, in a space where there is any physical security at all. Um, additionally, the people who are in the branch office may have no in, in, awareness of or interaction with the server hardware. There's yep. a total disconnect. Last but not least, the people who service the hardware are not necessarily company employees, nor do you even know who they are by name. So anybody can show up with a hat and a clipboard and say, I'm here to, you know, to, to do the monthly maintenance on the server, and oh yeah, here it is, right? You can't give them access. They can suck all the data, data off that onto you know, a USB or a 1394 drive, uh, walk away, and you never know the difference. So, um, so servers are actually something that, that we were told by customers when we went out, we went out and described how the technology worked. They told us, oh, man, we love to have this in server because you know, we've got a lot of unsecured servers. We've got thousands of unsecured servers, and it drives us nuts. Yeah. Um, now, do you need uh, for Bit BitLocker? What do you need a new kind of motherboard? So you need you you. The, when I talked earlier about there's multiple configurations. The best configuration is using a TPM. That uh, you need a TPM 1.2. Those are available in uh, some desktops and laptops today. There'll be a lot more in the future. So you do need a new system. You can also. Um, do it using just a USB dongle. Um, the plus side to that is that if the, the, the bad guy has taken your laptop and does not have the USB dongle, it's extremely secure. They have to break AES 150, 128 or 256, depending on what you've, how you've configured it. Um, so that's really hard to do. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's hard enough that you can be pretty gosh darn sure that it's just not going to happen. They can't peel a TPM, they can't physically attack the machine because the key that they need is in your pocket and they don't, they don't have access to that. Yeah. The downside is that, um, A, there's a good chance, in fact, that you left the key in the machine yeah. or in the bag you were carrying the machine in, yeah. in which case they're in. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, if you lose the key yourself, you're into recovery mode. And recovery mode is possible, but not easy, right? It's a 40-digit 40, 40 key. You have to enter it into a, 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 either a console from another copy of Windows or into a BIOS-based screen. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a F1, F7, F1, F2. We make up the number. You don't get to pick a password that's easy to remember because that would be easy to hack. So, uh, so that's, not, that's a non-trivial event. Yeah. Um, there have been people who have actually asked us, frankly, the main reason we did the USB, uh, USB support was because a small but very vocal contingent of the security community wants USB dongle support yeah. um, because they like the idea that, that there's no TPM to attack. And those kinds of people, frankly, are the kinds of people of the discipline to make sure that they don't leave the TPM, in, you know, they don't leave the dongle in the bag. So you can do it TPM with new systems. Um, HP uh, is currently shipping desktop systems today that you can buy. Great partner of ours. They'll be shipping laptops soon. We're also working with you know all the other major OEMs, IBM, Dell, Toshiba, Fujitsu, Siemens, um, uh, and they'll be shipping systems that support this. Okay. Does it usually cost a little bit more? Um, I, I can't. You know, I don't want to be accused of establishing pricing. Yeah. But. Um, uh, the cost is 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 sort of part of the noise, and you know you're buying a brand new box today. There's a good chance it's got a half a gig or a gig of memory. It's got wireless. It's got Bluetooth. It's got a bunch of other things. This is not a big cost adder, right? Um, and in fact, we're also seeing vendors who are incorporating what we sort of refer to as 
has, has integrated TPMs into other logic. So you've got TPMs that are showing up in Super IO chips, they're showing up in Gigabit Ethernet chips, um, they're showing up in uh, other kinds of integrated logic. And in that sense, they kind of are free. Because you're buying, you know, as, a, as an OEM, you're paying for the Ethernet controller, and you're getting, uh, you're getting TPM services for free as part of the cost. Right. Um, and so as a customer, you, you know, there's no cost adder in that context. Yeah. What's evil about this? Um, TPMs are hardware security, and hardware security is, you know, plus and a minus. Um, just like good guys can wear body armor, criminals can wear body armor. I, I don't think of TPMs as being innately good or innately evil. I think of them as being a really effective tool to solve some very specific problems. There's been a lot of noise around TPMs being evil. Um, that comment I made about how the TPM is responsible for protecting its key, some people think that's evil. They think that... Why? Because um, they think that there's, there's a nefarious purpose there. There's, there's, for some reason, I am, I am not allowed to know a piece of information, and information wants to be free. Um, it's, in this case, good security practice to not tell the user what that information is, because the user is very likely to make a mistake with it. Um, and uh, in the case of BitLocker, the user has full access to the drive. They've got a recovery key. We generate a recovery key for them. Mm -hmm. We're very aggressive, actually, about making sure that they save that recovery key in a place they can, they can get at it. So it's, there's never an instance in which the TPM is keeping a user from their data or keeping a user from unlocking the drive. That's a good point. But okay. there's a concern that TPMs could be used to do that because there's this little, you know, this little attribute they have of protecting their own data. Um, Could that's Microsoft just, ever use it to turn off a laptop remotely because you didn't pay your bill or something? No. I mean, no. I, not, not, not without, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's ridiculous to say blanket no because if Microsoft became, you know, suddenly very evil and decided they wanted to re-architect their entire operating system around that scenario, um, it's, I suppose, entirely plausible that they could. Uh, it'd be stupid business. Um, and BitLocker, and it would have nothing to do with BitLocker. Okay. BitLocker's, BitLocker's about making sure that when I show up at the door to go at my house, yeah. uh, and I've got my key, I get in. And if I don't have my key, I can knock, and my wife can come down and say, oh, it's you, and let me in. Yeah. And if a criminal shows up at my door and tries to get in, he can't. And if he knocks on the door, you look at him and go, I don't know who you are, you're not coming in. Um, that's all BitLocker's about. Um, TPMs have a bunch of really interesting attributes that you know should provide for a lot of really cool scenarios uh, that are above and beyond um, uh, just what BitLocker will do. Um, well, like what? Well, like the, the concept of machine identity actually gives you the ability to do things like um, strengthen virus antivirus updates um, because you can start creating circumstances where. Um, you sort of create a little secure partition or secure space within the, the PC. Oh, okay. Um, and uh, uh, that can let you do things like work around um, things like rootkits, right? Um, so one of the ways you could do that, for example, is in a multi-OS multi environment, if you're running multiple OSs side by side, there's hypervisors out there that will do that yeah. today. If one of those is a super secure partition uh, and it's got a hardware-rooted uh, TPM uh, based identity, then you can set up a, 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 a Windows update or an antivirus update service that is serviced via that partition, um, and uh, you can uh, you can a do the updates more securely. You can also do interesting things where if you um, if somebody gets in between that partition and the network, you can alert the user some other way. So like the user can set up a service that says, hey, you should hear from this machine identity every day at midnight. And if four days go by and you haven't heard from this service, give me a call on the phone or send me a piece of mail to my Hotmail account. And then when I open up my Hotmail, my Hotmail will say, dude, you haven't heard from you know, your security service in four days. You might want to take your machine offline and run you know, this thing here. Or maybe you've got malware. Or maybe you just your phone line's unplugged. Yeah. Um, or you're on vacation. Or you're on vacation, or whatever, right? But it lets you, it's just an additional set of data. It lets you do something interesting. Um, it lets you do something interesting that's very hard for bad software to get around. A lot of, a lot of what's ha what, what is happening in 
in the arms race of, of, of security today is an attempt to uh, subvert an operating system so that the operating system is no longer behaving in the manner in which it was either designed or the user wants without the user knowing. That's true. Right? Yeah. Um, and and in, in, in some ways, it's also, in other ca cases, it's about creating a fake user which then does things on your behalf, uh, which are not really on your behalf, like spends your money, yep. uh, gives away your data, or gives away uh, personally identifiable information. Um, so anything that lets you create a stronger, m more immutable um, identity yep. combination, like this is the machine, this is the software, this is the operating system, this is the service, this is the user, anything that makes that a stronger, harder to break with uh, a series of relationships is something that can benefit users because right. things like um, uh, things that, that, that work on chiseling into those spaces are, are less effective. It's, I mean, that's long-term stuff. Right? Yeah. It's not what we're doing in Vista. What we're doing in Vista is BitLocker. Um, and BitLocker is all about very, very simple equation, really. The drive is encrypted. You log in. The drive starts getting unencrypted. You use Windows the way you always have. You double-click on an icon. If it, Related to, relates to a file that's currently encrypted. It gets magically decrypted before you ever see it. You see it, it's magically decrypt, decrypted. You click on save, it gets magically de encrypted as it gets put down on the hard drive. Yep. It's all behind the scenes. You don't know anything about it. The scenario is very straightforward. It's physical access to a machine that you shouldn't have access to. Um, and uh, uh, it's about making sure that that, that that data is more secure than it is now. And turn it off. Right? Yeah. Does it does uh, BitLocker come on by default? No. If I buy TPMs are off by default. BitLocker is off by default. Okay. So it's something I actually have to. You have to consciously. Me or my IT guy has yeah. to actually turn on on yeah. the machine. You have to consciously go out and turn it on. And where do I turn it on? Uh, it's in control panel, and it's currently in control panel. I mean, we're in beta, so yeah. which, that's where it should be in final. Um, and it's also in Windows Security Center. Okay. And of course, if you went to the handy dandy search. Uh, or in the lower left and type BitLocker, I'm sure you'd find it as well. Okay. Find control panel. Cool. And uh, who are you? Now we have somebody else in the room, too. Okay. You're not even getting in this conversation. Yeah. Sure. Such an yeah. Who Here's, are you? I am Austin Wilson. I have uh, Windows Vista Security Product Management. So work with Peter's team all the time on BitLocker. Okay. So that's part of uh, part of what I do as well. So, and how do, uh, what is your team doing that's different from BitLocker? Basically, we're the marketing side. Oh, so. you're the marketing Yeah, guy. exactly. Oh, we'll, so. we'll, that's why yeah. we don't. <laughs> yeah. So Peter's telling a great story. We love marketing! <laughs> Peter's telling a great story of how the, how the technology works. I always give the mic to you guys, Cal. <laughs> that's all right. That's all right. It's right the resume. It's like ability to take punishment from engineers. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cheer, cheerfully, you know, withstands yet another stupid anti-marketing joke. Yeah. It's right there on the job. And there's plenty of those. But awesome. I, I do want to point out one scenario that Peter uh, Peter didn't talk about. Yeah. I know it's really important to him as well. And that's what happens when a PC hits end of life or you're going, you're going to turn it over to another person in the organization. Okay. That's another area where you have data on the machine and you're giving the machine either put it on eBay, giving it to charity or another person. Yeah. BitLocker is very useful in that scenario too because Peter's team is working on a utility that will basically just delete the key in the TPM. So if you've got a volume protected by BitLocker, delete the key in the TPM. So now you've got a bunch of encrypted data, no decryption key on it. You can format the drive, reload the OS, hand it to the next user, that data's gone. And it's not going to, you know, somebody's not going to buy that machine off of eBay, you know, run some tool on it and pull your, you know, old Excel spreadsheets off of it as well. And so another scenario that is valid and one where desktop we talk about it a lot as a mobile scenario, yeah. but when you look at the cost, what organizations spend at end of life and when they repurpose PCs, it's very viable for the desktop as well uh, because of that reason. Yeah, the numbers are really interesting. So um, if you think of, you know, the, the number I like to look at, because um, this really, I mean, this is good security practice. It's something I'm going to do. It's something I'm going to, you know, twist on my, my friend's arms to do as well. Yeah. But if you look at uh, uh, an enterprise with 100,000 desktops, the average enterprise refresh rate today is, is five years. So that means every year they're, they're, they're pumping 20,000 machines out and 20,000 machines in. When they put it, those 20,000 machines out, more often than not, in virtually all cases we see now, it actually goes back to a leaser. They actually don't own the PC, they lease it. 
Um, the leaser then resells or releases the PC. They have a tiering system, right? Yeah. So I get a top of the line PC based on whatever my criteria is. I keep it for five years. I give it back to you. You're, my, you're the leaser. You might sell it um, into uh, uh, a small business and or on an auction service and or in charity and or in uh, a socioeconomic um, space where people yep. uh, want cheaper PCs, right? Yep, a lot of um, machines go overseas. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. And um, so the interesting question is, is I'm, to be a responsible enterprise, how do I cope with the fact that I have to, I now I'm taking 20,000 machines a year and giving them back to people and I have no idea where they go. Yeah. Um, if I want to be super hardcore, I destroy the drive, yeah. which is um, uh, uh, bad because it, it reduces the physical value of the asset. And it means that I'm handing back to you a machine as the lease or a machine that doesn't that no longer works. Yep. You're going to have to try to find a hard drive that works on a five-year-old machine. It's going to have to be the same size. That's a pain in the ass, right? So um, what people uh, usually do um, is either they do nothing, which is a bad thing. I right? would not recommend against that. Or these, they do what's called zeroing up the drive. Zeroing up the drive basically takes a formatting tool and it turns every one and zero on the drive into a zero. Um, a lot of times, you know, there's been science that has said that you need to actually do this multiple times yeah. because you can use tools to go after, both software and hardware tools to go after the drives and try to figure out what was on it in spite of the fact that it got written to a zero. Yeah. Like, um, okay, so let's imagine that you had a machine for five years and you were working on a bunch of really valuable and interesting stuff. If you had a, a given file that sat in the same location for four and a half years, you know, four years and 11 months, and then in the 12th month, it got, the, the ones in that file all got turned to zero. Yeah. It may be fairly easy to actually fight, figure out that, oh, this, you know, there's the, 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 basically the magnetism for each one of those ones, yeah. um, it may be fairly easy to find. Yeah. It's kind of, I mean, you're out kind of in geeky land, but, but people have then said, okay, so we need to run these zeroing out tools more than once. So at the very least, you're zeroing out the drive, probably. You may be zeroing it out more than once. Yeah. If you are zeroing it out, that's not a quick format. That's a, sort of, a low-level format where you're, you're actually writing out every, single, um, every yeah. single bit. And so that can take hours. Yeah. You know, like an 80 gig or 120 gig drive, you may be looking at, I don't know, a couple hours. So 20,000 times a couple hours is your time budget. That means you have a bunch of people that you pay money to who you probably would rather do things like keep the vice president of marketing's machine up and running because he's about to go on the road. Instead of your IT people doing that, they're sitting there going yes, and then going to the next machine and going yes, and going to the next machine and going yes, and then going back and making sure it's not, you know, they got big rooms like this where these machines come through, they reformat them, all this stuff happens. Yeah. Uh, BitLocker. If the machine has had BitLocker on since you deployed it as an enterprise, there's never been a one or a zero on it of interest that has ever been unencrypted. Yep. So this whole concept of trying to figure out what it was before, move. Don't ever have to do that. Yep. Additionally, because all the data on the machine is encrypted, you don't have to ever go through the process of zeroing out the drive. You just lose the key. The key is small. It's easy to, it's easy to lose once you know, you've, you've said, yes, I'm sure, yes, I'm sure. I'm really, really, really positively, totally sure that I never want to get this data back. I understand that if I click this button again, the data would be gone forever and there's no way I can recover it. Yes, and it's gone. Um, so that's a few seconds, right? A few seconds versus a few hours. And frankly, it's a, it's a, it's a higher degree of protection for that data than, um, than, than some kinds of low-level formats. Yeah. We sort of refer to that as PC redeployment. We've gotten a lot of really positive feedback on that one as well. Yeah. Um, so we've talked to customers who've said, yeah, actually, we're considering turning BitLocker on in every one of our machines because we're going to front load a little bit of investment in BitLocker, which will save us um, a lot of investment when that machine gets redeployed. Yeah. Is there any chance of this system going awry and all of a sudden all my data is gone and I can't? get it back. And so catastrophic events can and will occur to some machines, right? So you drop the machine in the airport, right, in Tokyo, and the motherboard shorts out. And let's pretend for a second that because of a fluke of nature, the machine was running or in the process of hibernating or something, and you short out the TPM. Okay, so the, the keys that were originally used that, that, that root out that data are gone. Um, the classic scenario, which I've actually done, had machines that have failed. If you pull the drive out and you put it in another similar machine and you try to pick, right, try to get at the data, uh, well, the TPM is no longer in that machine, so you're in the recovery mode. 
So this gets down to what did you do when you originally set it up? Uh, our default makes you, um, if you're a normal user, uh, you know, just setting this up at home or at a small business or whatever, the default um, uh, requires you to actually save out a key right. because we think that it's very important. We don't want people to be in a position where we sort of, you know, they, they easily go, yeah, yeah, whatever, whatever, yeah, I'm sure, you know, and then a year later they're completely out of their data. Yeah. Um, so uh, this key is a 40-digit key. You can use it to recover. In domain join circumstances, we, we jam that key out into the into AD, um, uh, Active Directory. And so if you drop your machine and you don't happen to have your key, which is a very good chance, you would call your support professional and you'd say, hey, um, I dropped my machine. They go through the, the, the process of, a, of confirming that it's actually you and you're not a criminal trying to break into the machine. And then they read the key to you over the phone, you type it in, and away you go. Um, uh, the other you know, important thing, and everybody jokes about this, especially computer geeks, is backup, backup, backup. Yeah. Um, so even if you were good about your keys, it's probably also very smart to make sure that you're doing you know, routine backups. Yep. There's a lot of services now that back hard drives up in the middle of the night. There's even consumer services that do that. Oh, yeah, I have a box at home that just backs up. There's some cool peer-based services that do that as well. Those are all There's awesome. A lot of internet sites yep. coming up now too. Yep. Um, of course, that sort of <laughs> makes you a little, a little less secure again. Right. But you know, um, the uh, it depends on how you do it. It depends on you know. In the case of BitLocker, a back, any backup utility is picking up the data unencrypted. Yep. So there's no BitLocker encryption issue there. Right. Um, then you're relying on the, the backup service itself to protect the data, and hopefully the backup service is an encryption option and you know lets you manage it that way. Yep. Um, so uh, we think that catastrophic events should be pretty minor. Yep. Um, about as uh, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that they're about as common as the hard drive going south, yep. which you know in the past ten years I've owned computers, I've probably Owned, I don't know, I guess. <laughs> 20, 20 machines. Yeah. I probably had to replace two hard drives, maybe, and I'm, I'm rough on machines. So. Yeah. Um, uh, so maybe once every five years. We don't, yeah, I don't, we, we don't really know the numbers, yeah. but there's a, there's a small number of moving parts to go wrong. Um, TPMs are solid state. They're, you know, soldered yeah. to the motherboard. They're not removable. The users aren't spilling. I would expect them to fail. Far less often than hard drives because hard drives have three yeah, parts. Yeah, absolutely. Parts. I mean, yeah. So, um, and then then you get down to file things like file corruption are the files that are used to va to validate that that it's the proper OS um, that wants to boot. Or that, do those files get corrupted? Uh, again, historically, historically, uh, an MBR corruption, which is the kind of thing we'd be talking about, a master boot record in corruption, mm -hmm. would f cause the hard drive to be unbootable either way. Yeah. It's a catastrophic failure. Um, in the case of the BitLocker machine, you go into recovery mode. You type in the you type in the data. Um, you'd still need to figure out what's wrong with the MBR and fix that. But it's it's a again it's a fairly infrequent event. Interesting. Anything else I need to know about? Uh, yeah, no back doors. So. Oh. Um, well, what is that all about? Yeah. So. <laughs> I don't really know what that was all about. I don't. What we're talking about is yeah. on, on certain websites. Certain okay. websites reported that 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 uh, that, my, that you're being evil and that we're being evil and putting back doors into our tech into our product for government. Um, we're not. Uh, we have no intention to. We haven't. We won't. Um, it's you mean bad. even Bill Gates doesn't have a back door to my machine? No. Right. <laughs> it's bad security. Yeah. Right. Um, it's really bad security. How do we know you're not lying? Um, you, uh, there's a couple of ways. First of all, the, the, there's a lot of um, uh, institutions in the United States, like um, uh, colleges, that have access to the Windows source. So yeah. there's going to be people who are going to look at this. MPs, government. Uh, I can tell you I'm not lying, but you can just say I'm a winged monkey, black helicopter, evil guy, and just you know choose to. Aren't you? <laughs> can, can, you can you see them? <laughs> you know, I got plastic surgery. I thought uh, horns were, you know, were ground off with a bench grinder. Um, you know, the, uh, the, 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 it's bad business. And when we go out and talk to companies that give us millions or hundreds of millions of dollars, we have to look them square in the eye as well and say, you know what? There are no back doors. There's no back doors because it's bad business. Um, it's, it's really, 
something that any security professional understands. If you have any system which says that we're going we're gonna to only allow um, these people access, oh, except for these other little secret people, yeah. well, the other little secret people always get figured out. There's, you know, hackers are not all stupid, lazy kids, right? There are some very talented individuals out there who will in systems all the time. Yeah. And um, I don't want to make their lives easy by, by intentionally creating an opportunity for somebody to exploit my customer's systems. So um, it's really, you know, it's just plain flat out bad business. Yeah. It's also impractical because you, you, um, you're then in a position of, uh, or if you're going to create one, who's it for? How's it managed? You know, what do you do when gov government foo wants one and government bar wants one? And government foo wants one on government bar's machines, but not government bar's on government's food, you know, government foo's machines. So yeah. the other interesting concept is when you, you know, people say, well, governments must want backdoors. Um, independent of whether or not they do, they sure as heck don't want backdoors in their own machines. Yeah. Uh, even within, you know, um, uh, the United States government, you, you can be pretty sure that the, you know, agency X doesn't necessarily want agency Y to have a backdoor into agency X's machines. Yeah. You know, it's, ba it's bad security protocol. Um, so good security says, you make sure that you're the only one who has access to this data, um, and then you manage it. Yeah. That's true for governments, it's true for individuals, it's true for companies. Yeah. Oops. So no backdoors. I'm sure there's people out there going, I don't oh, yeah, believe you know, this guy. You know this guy's a Microsoft yeah. shill, he's Sport. paid yeah. off. Yeah. <laughs> you, can, you can absolutely, and I, you know, I've been working on, I've been working in this space for long enough and I've been called a, 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 you know, an evil, evil liar enough times. You know, there are people who won't believe it when we say that. Um, and uh, uh, there's not, uh, um, for some people, there's nothing I can do. I could sit down with them and let them walk through every line of our source code, and they still wouldn't believe it. Because a, a really well-written backdoor will be undetectable when you read the source code. Right? Yeah. That's its purpose. Um, we are going to do things like uh, do external audits of our, uh, of our source code. We've worked with external companies already to do security analysis of our product because we want it to be as secure as possible. Yeah. Um, uh, we'll look at what we need to do around um, final analysis of our final source code for people to say, yeah, no, let's Looks good to us. We we you know we couldn't find anything in there. Um, uh, there's no bugs. You know, knock on wood. All software has bugs, but we're going to try to make sure that we're as exploit free as we can be. Yeah. Um, and the test of time will be there, right? Yeah. I mean, then you just have to wait. Because everybody, time. every security researcher out there would love to put one to the man. You think right? there's a backdoor? <laughs> Absolutely. Look, I mean, yeah. If you think there's a backdoor and you don't trust us, don't trust us with your data. I mean, don't use us. It's just you know or. That's it's pretty straightforward. We're off by default. Um, you don't, you know, TPMs are off by default according to the TCG spec. Get lockers off by default. Um, uh, just don't use it. Can I plug in a different TPM? Um, TPMs are standardized, so you can use multiple vendor TPMs. So if you like the TPM from a certain company, um, you can use theirs instead of somebody else's. Okay. Uh, uh, that's you know. That, Absolutely, your option. I mean, it, some systems you won't be able to plug a TPM in. Remember, the TPM is supposed to provide machine identity. If it, you can plug it in like you can plug in a PC card, then it's not providing any machine identity at all. It's providing PC card identity. Yeah. Um, or USB, if it was a USB dongle identity. That doesn't actually prove anything about the machine. The other thing is your machine has to have uh, specific BIOS support for your yeah. TPM as well. So it's, it's the TPM plus the enabling BIOS that you have to have, So which isn't necessarily pluggable. You can just take another TPM unless the OEM in your machine wrote a BIOS that enabled that as well. So very cool. It's pretty much you're going to get it with the machine. Cool. Anything else we should know about security in Vista? Uh, there is a, a lot I could go on for uh, for hours oh, about God, security and uh, <laughs> in Vista. Comp you know, one other thing I'll I'll mention certainly that's a critical part of security in Vista is user account control, which is the ability to run as a non-admin. Yeah. Big We've focus in Vista that, there huh? and. So certainly want people to try out the February CTP, both the BitLocker functionality is there, user account control That's is there. It, BitLocker yeah, it's, is it's in there. February CTP, Correct. was it an yes. earlier version? It was in the December as yeah. well. Uh, the December one, um, you know, our UI sucked. We were all text mode. 
Right. Right. Are we still well, text mode? No, December? December actually had the UI in it, but there was a bug in the file system in December that some people ran into. We saw on the forums out there that if you turned it on, you would get the Longhorn splash screen and stop. It would just boot with freeze, and there was really no recovery from that. That's that's gone. In the uh, in the February CTP, you can try it out, give it a shot. If you have a machine without TPM, you can store the key on USB and try it that way. Certainly. Right. Read the readme. It's a beta. Yeah. Read the readme. Read the readme. It's a beta. Yeah. yeah. Um, Generate a recovery key. Yeah. yeah. Generate a recovery. Print key. it out. Actually. And I would certainly, not, you know, not. Uh, it's, a, it's a CTP. I would not. I would not trust your, you know, your only copy of your family photos to BitLocker yet, right? Okay. Or beta. Um, we're pre, you know, we're between beta one and beta two. We're right. CTP, so. um, but yeah, by all means, people should try it out. You can do it, and be, you can do it with just a USB dongle. The key is that you have to have a machine that supports access to the dongle um, pre-boot. Okay. So um, most machines that are less than two years old will do that. Okay. But not all of them do. Okay. Um, I believe, I, can't, I don't think we have a, I don't know if we're including a test that will let you test that or not. Some discussion around We've got that. an yeah. internal test that lets you check. Mm -hmm. I can't remember if we're including, if that's in the CTP or not. It's not um, there yet. Yeah. It yeah. isn't? Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah, so so we would um, uh, we would uh, the way you would test that is you would turn it on and then you'd reboot the machine and see what happens. Um, it's fairly straightforward in the sense that uh, it's good practice on machines that you're running these things on to be running have two copies of Windows in the machine anyways. So yeah. have two partitions, have C colon run your Windows XP partition, um, put Vista in your D colon partition. Yeah. Nothing that I know of. In the case of Vista or BitLocker, is going to if you install it into a clean D, D colon drive, is going to affect your Windows and your C colon. So right. you can always just go, oh, this doesn't work, and start over. Yeah, that's how I do it. Cool, cool. Thanks for thank uh, you spending some time. Explaining you